All right, uh, I think we'll get started here. It's about five after. I let folks keep trickling in, but we don't want to run late so we can get to the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to walk and talk with the mic. That's just my style. So um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm really, we're all, Brian and I are both really excited to be here. Uh, for folks just trickling in, this is the 2014 State of the Union Address session that we're about to start here. So um, really quickly, uh, I'll introduce myself, and then Brian will introduce himself a little bit later when we, when we get to talking. But um, uh, I am the, as it says on the screen, I think, or it doesn't, uh, Director of New Media Technologies at the White House. Um, that basically means uh, we oversee uh, all the teams that do the development and operations of all the White House's uh, online engagement platforms. Uh, basically, we build engagement tools. And so uh, we're going to talk to you today about um, basically a case study of a, of a specific event, the tools that we, that we built, the features we built for that specific event. This would be the 2014 State of the Union Address. Um, and the role that, um, that open source uh, technology and actually building for open source, uh, regardless of whether or not you're going to, to, to release the code, why that's important and how the, the, the principles of that got us the ability to, to uh, build some really fantastic features uh, really quickly with a high degree of reliability on a very, very critical day. I'm going to start pretty much what we'll say is I talk about the why, and then I'll hand off to Brian, and he's going to talk about the how. So I'm going to open by talking to you today a little bit about the strategy that went into uh, the, the, the features we focused on for this year's event and how that played out and why, why some of those strategies were so important to us and why it was critical that we, we, we implement them for us. So um, our strategy for this year's event... Uh, distilled down to uh, basically uh, three principles, and uh, I'm going to talk primarily about the first two, and uh, Brian's going to hit uh, on those two plus a third one. Um, but our biggest priority for this year was to focus on, a, on an epic mobile experience, to have a fantastic mobile experience for anyone who wanted to engage about the uh, 2014 State of the Union uh, through whitehouse.gov or if you were watching the stream uh, through one of our partners. And so with that in mind, uh, it was very important to us. We knew kind of off the bat that responsive design was going to play a major role in that. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why that was, because it wasn't just about sort of we're building something new. We should use the latest, you know, the latest uh, cutting-edge technology in, in website design. There's actually real uh, le you know, strategic reasons behind it. Um, and then the other part uh, that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, a social engagement that – um, like I said, what we do as, as part of the new media technologies team is that we collaborate with the digital strategies team, which is basically the content team, to, uh, to essentially figure out what are the new features, to come up with the features that will continually uh, improve and increase and broaden uh, the president's and the administration's level of engagement with, with people who want to interact with us online. And that's not just citizens, that's, that's people all over the world. Um, and so part of that also was uh, adding features that could really accelerate the social engagement part uh, of the speech because we know, you know, as, as, as many of you, I'm sure, are on Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, that big events like this, you know, lead to, like, very big, very strong uh, conversations online. And we wanted to make that experience better, improve it, make it easier uh, to talk about it, and make it easier to engage us in that conversation as well. Oh, uh, and the other thing, we had eight weeks to do it. And I'll talk a little bit really quickly about why that is, uh, that we essentially, I'm sure this is an experience, when I tell this, like, people um, come to me a lot, and they're like, yeah, can you talk more about the experience of how you deal with these tight timelines? And Because it seems like it's a pretty common experience that, you know, we're essentially, especially in an event-driven space that we work in, a political space where we're sort of essentially always having these, you know, we're rolling from one critical thing to another. And so although we know the State of the Union is coming, we know kind of when it is, um, the work of the White House and the work of, you know, sh you know engaging with the president's message online, uh, you know, doesn't stop. We can't just hit the pause button on all the other things. And so we'll have other initiatives happening, like, uh, you know, whether it's the environment or whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's increasing the minimum wage, all of these things that we work on, we can't stop work on those features, those projects to get started, even though as much as we want to. Um, and that's the environment that we work in. And so Brian's going to be talking a lot today about the, um, 
the, the methods that we've adopted to essentially stick to our, uh, our core principles and continue to develop uh, open source and the advantages that we get from that. So uh, I want to talk really quickly about why this mobile strategy was so important for, uh, for our approach to this year's event. And uh, this next graph, uh, probably many of you are seeing something similar. Uh, it probably looks completely different. But the data that you're seeing mirrors this at your own, your own organizations on your own sites. And what you're seeing here is basically the, 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 the decline of desktop viewership on whitehouse.gov. The, the, the visitors on whitehouse.gov, you know, four years ago, almost everyone was coming on a desktop browser. Um, and as you see, sort of 2010 or so, that, that light blue bar starts, to, that wedge starts creeping in. There's our, our mobile presence growing. And it's now a quick, straight linear growth. You know, 2011, iPad launches, and we start seeing that gray bar at top where we start to see the tablets rolling in. And so now we're at, you know, nearly a third of our visitors you know, week in, week out, are, are on some kind of mobile device. And so in and of itself, that's a compelling reason, and we're all kind of having this conversation, I'm sure many of the folks in the room are, about why it's important to, to do this, because it's like here's a, a, an unambiguous situation where our audience is telling us how they want to interact with us. And so just on that part, it's interesting, it's compelling, sure, we should do it because people are telling us they want to do it, but there's more to it than that, and it's a much more uh, uh, important thing to, to you know, it, to me in particular, but I think to uh, other folks, especially in the, in the public sector space. Because, you know, what we know, Pew has done a bunch of research and many others, what w the big trend we're seeing growth of is people using their mobile devices as their primary internet access. And so Pew's uh, study last year came out and said 34% of people who own a mobile phone use it as their primary way of accessing the internet. Not desktops, not laptops, but through their mobile device. And so that's, again, people are doing that. That mirrors the number that I showed you in the previous slide. But when we actually look at it from a demographic perspective, that a new story emerges, right? When we look at the rates of people who use a mobile device for their primary way of accessing the Internet, you know, and we look at people of color, we look at young people, people of low income, we see that number go as high as 60%, way above the national average way above at the national average. And in particular, when we look at the, most of these, these, these groups, remember, this is the president's message to the country. This is, the, this is a conversation. You know, it's a message to Congress. It's, a, it's the president basically stating his agenda for the year. And it's not just a speech to people who have cable TV, cable networks, broadband, and desktop computers. It's to everyone. And so when we look at these demographics, in fact, you know, this is about creating a fully featured experience, in particular for those citizens who are often least served by technology. And that's where the compelling aspect like, of the mobile strategy comes in. It's way more than just our audience is saying they want it. It's that there are people who stand to benefit the most, and it's important to us, and I contend to everyone in this room, to really address those constituencies. So what we did was, here's a look at the 2013 page. This is what we were sort of the baseline that we were starting from. It's not responsive, um, and sort of the core feature is the player up front. Now, uh, I need to stop for a second here. Um, what you're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen there, uh, we, since 2011, we've been producing uh, what we call an enhanced live stream. So what's different about when you come and watch the live stream on whitehouse.gov or on one of our partner uh, uh, channels you're seeing additional content, more than just the president talking, but a series of supporting graphics, supporting content that goes with this. Really quickly, actually, how many people watched the State of the Union this year? Go ahead, raise your hand. We won't judge you. Well, I won't judge you if you don't raise your hand. <laughs> um, okay, how many people uh, watched it online? Excellent, fantastic. Probably about not quite a third of the room. Okay, how many people watched on TV? Great. Okay, I'm going to be talking to you guys again in a minute, so remember that you raised your hand. So all those folks watching online, what you got was this experience where you saw the, 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 the graphs like scrolling by. Now, the, I need to stop and say our eight-week achievement was really exciting for us, from, for, you know, for software developers, for software engineering. But we also have a team of designers who I have to call out to whenever I get an opportunity. It's really got nothing to do with Drupal. It's got nothing to do with open source. It's just a really amazing accomplishment. There's a team of four designers. They get a draft of the speech about four days before the president delivers it. It's the first time they get to see a draft of it. 
And they have to start working on these supporting graphics, these supporting images in that span of time. We produce around 120 of these. We only end up using about a third of those because the speech changes so much over the days and, in fact, even changes as he's get delivering it. So we have the, the, the transcript as prepared, but he deviates from it. And so if we have you know, a graphic that goes with a particular sentence and he chooses not to use that sentence, we can't use that graphic. So they produce about 120 of these graphics that have to be uh, fact-checked, they have to be spell-checked, proofread. We have to make sure we have the rights to use any of the images that are in it. And on top of all that, it also has to meet with the design standards of you know, what is expected from the White House brand. And so it's, I really, it's, it's amazing to watch this thing happen. This is a group of people who basically kiss their families goodbye on a Wednesday and say, I'll see you next week, and that's the end of it, never leave. Um, it's really amazing. And so we really uh, put a lot of effort into this enhanced speech, but the way we implement it, those graphics that you're seeing are embedded into the stream itself, which is really helpful for sharing the stream with our partner, uh, network. So if you're watching on YouTube or Hulu or something like that, you can see these supporting graphics. But what the downside is is that you can't interact with this or you can't easily interact with it, right? So if you see this graphic and you, say, want to share it with your friends on Twitter or Facebook, you've got to be really quick with your fingers, grab a screenshot, and then tweet it out. Um, so in addition to sort of putting a lot of burden on you to do that, it also means that we get left out of the conversation. The the, the cohesion that exists in social networking, we're essentially losing that piece of the conversation. And it's actually not just a detriment to, to, to us from an engagement perspective, but it's actually the larger conversation loses out on those interactions because we're not speaking from a common framework. So this is what the page looked like this year. Um, now, I'll point out there's a, it looks very similar, but it's a responsive player, uh, and all the functionality is, is much more responsive. The player scales down. And now what you see below it is this section here. Um, and you see the content, that slide now is replicated, only now you've got a tweet that goes with it and a graphic that goes with it. And that graphic scales, I didn't silly of me get a screenshot of it while it was happening. Um, but if you look at this on a mobile phone, you, you know the image is smaller and the tweet button is below it and the text kind of slides in underneath it. So you can imagine... Uh, what's that? What that's like? And now, boom! There's a button for you to hit, and you don't have to be quick, and you don't have to know the key sequence for getting a screenshot. And you get the tweet, and it's 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 with our tweet pick, and it's like this is now many people tweeting the same image in the same way and getting to share a conversation. Now, uh, really quickly, uh, raise your hands again if you were watching on TV. Cool. Now, of those folks, keep your hands up. How many folks with your hands up now also had your tablet in your lap or your phone out and you were, you were tweeting along with us? About, about three or four people did that. Okay, that's given the numbers we have here. I'd say that third that we said that engaged with us online uh, initially, now we've raised that to, let's call it 20, you know, 39%, not quite 40%. Um, and so we had something for you too. So if you look actually in the, um, just above the president's head there, there's a little another tab there that says, hey, are you watching on TV? This is called the second screen experience for those uh, who haven't already heard the term. But it's this idea that, like, you don't have to watch our live stream. There's a high probability if you're watching on TV, especially for events, especially for political junkies and people who are, you know, really everyone, you know, who's watching on TV, whether it's the State of the Union, whether it's the Super Bowl, whether it's, you know, ice skating on the Olympics, people are, are engaging about the content. And we say we want to be a part of that conversation, too. So now we've created another tab, again, fully responsive, image scales, text shifts around, but you don't need to be watching TV. We close down the player so you're not you know, burning bandwidth on something you don't need, and up front and first is the ability to tweet images. So you're hearing the president talk you know, about the PS plus one negoti P5 plus one negotiations with Iran, and in your phone or your tablet pops up a graphic about it that you may or may not want to tweet with your friends. And so the tremendous you know, focus that we put on this mobile and social strategy, like we really believe it played some massive, massive dividends for us. And so first thing, biggest uh, State of the Union we've ever had, our live stream viewership went up nearly 40% this year. And like as a footnote to this, all the television networks were reporting that viewership was down uh, overall. And 
the story that's told is that it's people aren't watching, but in fact, we have the data to show that they're just not watching on TV. And that, like us and other partners saw a huge inrush this year of people just saying, I want to watch this, I want to consume this online. Huge success with that. Like I said, busiest, most State of the Union traffic we've ever gotten since we've been doing this, and that's since 2009 uh, as a live stream. Um, and those features that we built for, uh, for social engagement, 90,000 tweets and 70,000 uh, shares on Facebook of our, of our content. So huge, huge uh, uh, effectiveness of those tools that we built. Uh, for folks who are wondering, uh, the most tweeted slide, the most tweeted uh, content from that enhanced live stream uh, was this one here. It's about uh, the uh, lifetime cost, lifetime impact of the wage gap, lifetime income gap uh, for women. Um, and this is obviously a compelling slide here. It's a topic that we all know to be very important to the president. But what we also have from this and from having this online engagement strategy, we have unambiguous data-backed information on like what topic resonated the most highly with the people who were engaging with us online about the speech. And we can bring that to all manner of audiences. And so that's um, you know, that's a big part. That was our strategy. That was the achievements uh, that we focused on. That's why we did what we wanted to do. And so um, with that, I'm going to hand off to Brian here, and he's going to actually talk about the, the how, we, how we did it all. This is, um, thanks. And here, I'll be back. We'll be back for questions. Thanks. I'm actually going to okay. use this. All right. All right. Thanks, Lee. Uh, I'm Brian Hirsch. I lead Lee's web team. And um, before we, I actually dive into the, the way, way behind the scenes part of this talk, I'm curious to know who we have in the room here with us. Can I just see a show of hands how many folks here are developers? OK, a lot. How many people here are project managers, program managers, product owners? OK. How many people here are either government employees or government contractors? OK, a lot. Great. OK, well, thank you again for, for coming. Um, so today, five years after President Obama issued his open government directive, um, more agencies conduct business online and more electronic data is available than ever before. And a huge amount of that stuff is powered with open source technology. And that's great, but there's more work to do to make this stuff reusable. So you know, the, the ideal scenario would be that as we're investing in these solutions, uh, we, we can reuse a proven solution over and over again uh, at the federal, state, and local level at a fraction of the initial cost. And so um, what I'm going to be talking with you guys about here is specifically the, the technical victories behind the scenes that we had during the State of the Union in achieving reuse. So uh, we, had a big, we had a big success with content administrators feeling personally the benefits of building reusable tools with the long page tool that we used to build the State of the Union so to page. We had um, an opportunity to reuse a scalable queuing back end that we had built for a totally different application. So we reused that in, in the whitehouse.gov uh, so to page and, and um, all of that work is released on Drupal.org and reusable by others. And then we also, uh, with the tweet server distro that we built to power the Twitter tool that Lee was just showing you all, um, we had an opportunity to test and validate a new workflow that makes building and releasing reusable stuff a lot easier for us. And, um, and then we also packaged up that workflow in some Drush extensions that are now open source projects as well. So uh, first I'll talk about long page. Drupal gives us lots of tools to make things reusable, right? We have uh, designs can be made reusable as themes. Features can, can be made reusable as modules or whole web applications can be made reusable as Drupal distributions. But making things reusable isn't just about saying to our developers, can you please make us modules, themes, and Drupal distributions. And in, in applications like whitehouse.gov, non-technical stakeholders and content administrators have a critical role to play in building for reuse. And I think that the long page feature is a great example of how this sort of thing uh, should go. We had multiple different departments, each investing in different pieces of new functionality, and everyone got out of this tool more than their department put into it. Um, so first, the Office of Digital Strategy built this uh, preventing gun violence page in the wake of the Sandy Hook shootings. And uh, like a number of our legacy pages, 
This was done as a code in the node one-off. Code in the node is what we call pages that are built by storing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript alongside content and, and saving it into the database. So one of the downsides of the code in the node approach to building pages is that this stuff isn't reusable. So we enlist a front-end developer uh, to work on a page like this, and then after you know, the event of the campaign or whatever passes, the work that went into this page can't be reused after that. So uh, next, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP, came to us, I think, a year before uh, this big report launch that they were getting prepared for. And coming to us with that much lead time, we had an opportunity to actually build them a tool, not just a page. And so uh, we knew that they really liked this preventing gun violence page that the Office of Digital Strategy had made. So we said, why don't we treat this like a proof of concept, like a static HTML mock-up of the kind of thing that we want to use for your report launch. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll set up some content types and we'll build you some administrative tools so that your staff, content administrators and non-technical people can build pages like this all by themselves without a front-end developer. So here's the drug policy reform page that they put together with our new long page tool. In contrast to the Preventing Gun Violence page, it was built by ONDCP program staff. Uh, and now anybody who can create content on whitehouse.gov can make pages like this without knowing any HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. And, um, and I am not sure if, uh, well, so another benefit of that, I can't remember if I was supposed to say it in the last slide or the next. Um, Administrators can change this stuff on the fly whenever they need to. It's really easy to make last minute changes and all of that can be done without any, any code changes, without any hot fixes. It's safe, it's stable, it's easy. Um, so as people throughout last year have been reusing this tool for all kinds of things we never imagined, like this foreign policy page, uh, we've added new navigation options, we've, add new, we've added new content sections like this highlight section and this latest news section, uh, new styles, other new sections that we've built to go along with the new styling on the Consumer Hub Tools page. Um, so all of this stuff is now part of our long page toolbox and you know, reusable with our new, our new long pages. And so by the time the State of the Union rolled around, we, just, we, we had a lot of infrastructure in place. This was gonna be another long page and uh, it would have some new styling and some new tools. Um, but you know, Lee already showed what it looked like so I won't go back through that again, but the, the point is that um, reusable tools like this don't happen overnight. They take several iterations, they evolve over time, they require a tight feedback loop between content creators and developers, and even though this page looked and felt new, it was running on stable, field-tested infrastructure, and it was all possible because uh, one department had it available to them from another department investing in reuse. So the long page is a great example of what reusability, what building for reuse looks like internally, inside a single application from the perspective of non-technical stakeholders. But there's more to this, right? We don't just want to make things that are reusable inside one website. We want to make stuff that we can reuse across different web applications. So the AWS SQS module is uh, a great example of uh, realizing that vision. Uh, for, for, the, for the, the back end of the State of the Union. So um, the State of the Union is the White House's largest predictable high traffic event that we have each year. So tons of people tune in online to view the online broadcast, and that's a great opportunity to give people a chance to sign up for our email newsletter, for example. But there's a catch with this. If we put a form like this on the slash so to page uh, that is submitting data that's submitting form submissions directly to Drupal's MySQL database, we open ourselves up to the possibility that we could receive more submissions than, than we can handle at once. So um, when everything gets funneled into a single MySQL database, at some point the pipe just gets clogged, right? So um, this could be because of a malicious distributed denial of service attack. But this could also be because there's just an overwhelming volume of legitimate submission, submissions coming in and we're effectively DDoSing ourselves at that point. And obviously we don't want to you know, take our own site down in the middle of one of our biggest events. So, um, so our CDN 
uh, we offload a huge amount of, effectively, all of our, our read traffic to our CDN, our content delivery network, Akamai, during the State of the Union. But, but something that we can't offload to our CDN is rights or form submissions. So to solve that problem, when we have huge spikes in form submissions, we need to be able to bring up as many you know, servers as we need to handle the influx in traffic. So you can see lots of servers coming up as traffic is increasing. And then we need to be able to route those submissions to a scalable queuing backend. So this cloud represents our, our queuing system in, in the cloud that is scaling as, as submissions go up. And then uh, on a separate process, um, you see another server in the background here that is dipping into the queue and then pulling things out of the queue to process and send to MySQL at a rate that we control that we know is not going to put our infrastructure at risk. So um, it just so happens that we solved this exact same problem last summer for petitions.whitehouse.gov, our We the People petitions application. So uh, that's an application that has huge unpredictable spikes in traffic, and um, we're building uh, this new uh, write API that lets people build third-party applications against the We the People tool, which, by the way, is in beta right now. If anyone's interested in developing uh, with the, the We the People API, talk to me about it afterward. I'll get, get you a key. Um, but so to solve that problem for petitions.whitehouse.gov, we worked with Nick Wienhoff on Drupal.org um, to uh, build on top of his proof of concept AWS SQS module. We rewrote it using Amazon's latest PHP SDK to swap out Drupal's default MySQL-based queue backend for Amazon's simple queue service. So that's what the AWS SQS module does. And so with that uh, infrastructure already available to us, all we had to do for the State of the Union was stand up a really simple new Drupal 7 site and snap the AWS SQS module into it and put a little form in front that we could iframe into whitehouse.gov on the slash so to page. And that way, when form submissions were coming in, we were able to, to send those to our scalable queuing backend, not directly to our MySQL database, you know, and handle the influx in form submissions. Um, so, and all of that stuff is available on Drupal.org. So any other government agency or any other Drupal user that wants an easy way to scale rights, you know, it's available for you there. So that's, that's what we think reuse looks like. So now we've got administrators who are excited about reusable tools um, rather than building one-off pages. We've got Lee and other uh, department directors who are seeing a great return on their investment when we're investing in reusable tools um, on the back end of our infrastructure. So how practical is it, though, really, to make everything reusable, to open source everything we build? How many people here, I'm curious to know just by a show of hands again, uh, have either decided not to, to open, have either found that open sourcing something took extra time or cost, or you decided not to open source something you were working on because someone told you it was gonna take more time or cost extra money? Anyone? Okay, so that's no good, right? Uh, open sourcing our work should be simple, should be easy. This is what it should look like. Hey Brian, remember that thing we built that time for that other thing? Yeah. We should totally open source that. Oh, Lee, that's such a great idea. We totally should. So then I should be able to do this. Uh, here Let's you see it. me inside of the tweet server code base. You'll recognize this probably as a Drupal doc root. And so these are the con contrib modules inside the code base that we built. And so here I'm typing drush subtree push Twitter API to push changes from the Twitter API module out of the tweet server site repo up to drupal.org. It says complete. Did that look easy? Come on, someone not. That looked easy, right? Okay. Uh, that's the world that I live in now, in the executive office of the president. And um, this year's State of the Union gave us a rare opportunity to build a whole new Drupal distribution from scratch, starting with a bunch of new policies and workflows that we've put in place. Um, and the, the workflow that you just saw is the product of, of that uh, new workflow. And um, so I'm going to give a quick overview of how the tweet server distro fit into the State of the Union so you understand how the pieces fit together. And then I'm going to talk about how um, the tweet server uh, is the sort of next evolution of lessons that we learned 
since our first major open source project, uh, our first Drupal distribution petitions. You know, we've learned a number of things and changed a lot of our workflow. Okay, so Lee showed earlier some screenshots of how the, tweet, the, the, the Twitter features worked. So during the State of the Union, as the president's speaking, there are some people tweeting from at White House on Twitter, uh, live tweeting either quotes from the president's speech uh, or sometimes quotes that go along with some of these graphics from the enhanced broadcast. So we're monitoring that Twitter feed. We're looking just for tweets that have twit pics associated with them because we're powering a slideshow, right? We don't want to send up the things that don't have graphics. And then we're sending those up to the online uh, broadcast, and um, the site is then able to parse and repackage that information so it looks like a slideshow and, and is clickable and shareable to people's social networks. So under the hood, here's how that all worked. So we built a lightweight Drupal 7 tweet server distro, and tweet server's job is to use Twitter's REST API to watch the White House user's account and watch for new tweets. And as new tweets are coming in, we're slurping those in via the REST API, and then we're applying our own custom filter to see if it has a twit pic associated with it. And then if it does, we write that to a static JSON file that we then push up to our content delivery network, Akamai Net Storage, where client-side JavaScript is polling to check for new tweets as they come available and then displaying them in this rotating slideshow on people's screens. So um, as an aside, if we'd, uh, if we'd had more time, we might have done this with uh, the Twitter streaming API. Um, but th this was perfect, perfectly fine for our needs um, and our, our, time, our time constraints and uh, really did, did the job for us. So that's why we picked this, this approach. Um, I think happily for folks in the Drupal community who might be interested in reusing this, all of this can be stood up uh, very simply on any, any infrastructure that's already hosting your Drupal website. And if you don't have a CDN in front of your site, I think with Varnish in front, you could probably handle a pretty good volume of traffic with this sort of thing. Um, so we built Tweet Server in two weeks. We open sourced the whole thing in a month. And um, that includes the Tweet Server distro, the Twitter API module, and the Net Storage module. Um, so there, there are 10 things that we did differently for the Tweet Server project in contrast to our first open source distro petitions. And no single one of these things is revolutionary by itself, but taken together, it adds up to a really different, a really different experience in, in building and releasing this stuff. So I'm gonna just run us through those 10 lessons learned here. Lesson one, code, code comments, and commit messages all are written to drupal.org standards now. So petitions was developed in private. It was uh, running, it, it was actually powering an application for about a year before we released it to the United Nations and members of the, the open source community. And so by the time we released, you know, there were thousands of lines of code and so many different people who'd worked on it. There was no single person who could say with confidence, we, we want to actually release every bit of, of you know, stuff that's in here. So we had to do this site audit. And when we're doing this site audit, we're not just auditing for security issues. We're, you know, what if someone had made a snarky comment in a, in a git commit message? So, you know, one day git commit messages are so esoteric that nobody even knows that, hardly any, any other people in the White House even know these things exist. The next day, this stuff is on GitHub. This could be shared on Twitter or Facebook. And, um, you know, that's potentially scary to a lot of people. So after petitions, we formalized as part of our code review process that we code review not just code, but also code comments and commit messages, and all that stuff gets held to drupal.org standards. If it doesn't meet those standards, it gets you know, kicked back to development before it passes QA. Uh, lesson number two, release early and often. There are a lot of good reasons for this, but one of those reasons is that when it's time to release, when Lee says, hey, Brian, we should release this thing, uh, did it all meet our standards? Is it OK to release this stuff? Someone in the room can say, yeah, I was there. It's all, it's all releasable. It's all ready to go. And so uh, just an example, here's, here are some statistics from Git that show you uh, the number of changes in the site repository, excuse me, in the code base between the first commit and the commit where we actually decided to open source the project. So in petitions, 633 files were changed, uh, 35,289 lines of code were written or changed. Um, in the tweet server project, we 
wrote 17 files and 919 lines of code before releasing this project. So measured by lines of code, we did about 3%, less than 3% as much work on Tweet Server uh, you know, when it was time to release before the first release. Lesson three, code reviews via pull requests. The way that we do code reviews has changed. Um, before, we left it up to developers to basically decide when something had been sufficiently code reviewed and was ready to release. And that, that process was error prone. Even in the best of scenarios, it was really easy for there to be a miscommunication where someone thinks something's been code reviewed um, when maybe it hasn't. Or you know, some, sometimes it could happen that someone accidentally clobbers someone else's work without knowing it. So now the way that we do this is, it is like this. All of our code lives on GitHub. The White House has its own GitHub account. And anytime someone wants to work on something, um, the White House has its own repository, its own project on GitHub for each different site code base that we maintain or work on. So here you're seeing um, D7 Multi is the, the tweet server code base. And so if a developer wants to work on the tweet server code base, um, they have to fork that repo. So they make a copy of that project over to their own user account on GitHub. So here you can see Mariano forking a project. Uh, to the right, you see the Mariano Osselborn account on GitHub, uh, slash D7Multi, that's his copy of the project. When he's doing work on it, he's saving his changes to the Mariano Osselborn copy of D7Multi. And when he wants to, to get those changes included back in the White House's code base to get pushed out to production, he sends a pull request to the White House, which displays all of the changes that will be made if the White House accepts the changes that Mariano has submitted. And um, all, all work that comes in like this gets peer reviewed by someone other than the author of the pull request. And so here you can actually see uh, a code review where I'm commenting on uh, a pull request that Mariano submitted a week before the State of the Union. And um, this, surface, this workflow surfaces all of the specific changes. So it's impossible to, for us to have one of these scenarios where uh, something slips in without getting reviewed or someone accidentally clobbers someone else's work because it's all surfaced and, and right in front of you there. This also makes it really easy to make very specific comments on people's work, which is great for giving feedback and code reviews. So since we've switched to this GitHub pull request workflow, the number of regressions, the number of situations where a fixed bug uh, you know, gets unfixed accidentally has basically dropped to zero on our projects. So uh, now we do pull requests. Lesson number four, project names. So here's another thing that's trivial to do if, if you do it as you go, and it saves a huge number of headaches down the line. So a number of people in our community are, are uh, in the habit of naming custom modules with this pattern, my company underscore my module, or my agency underscore my module. So that may seem innocuous or trivial, but um, it's a major obstacle to maintainability down the road. So uh, in our White House code base, someone at some point, I'm sure for a reason that it made sense at the time, um, named one of the modules in our petitions code base WH underscore something. Excuse me. And so then after that, our developers just started following that pattern. Anytime someone created a new custom project, a theme or a module, it would get named WH underscore my module. And so, as, as time passed, um, you know, no one follows that pattern on no one follows that pattern on Drupal.org, and so I think people reasonably assumed the stuff isn't destined for Drupal.org. It's internal stuff, and if it's internal stuff, why not write, Why not put White House specific things into those modules? And so over time, we we accumulated this pile of modules that are all prefixed wh underscore something. And they've all got mixed up in them uh, White House specific logic or White House specific configuration that is commingled with generic website functionality. And so, to open source any of that stuff on Drupal.org or to share it with another agency, you know, someone would have to go through the time-consuming and laborious process of like picking apart the generic and White House specific stuff and putting it in their own projects, renaming every file and every function in any given project that's named wh underscore. So. Rather than let the perfect be the enemy of the good, we just drew a line in the sand about two years ago, and we said, from now on, 
We write everything as if it's going to get contributed. And actually, this year, Lee has told us the new default is that all of the code we write gets, gets open sourced unless there's a good reason not to. So uh, that means it goes in a module that's not named wh underscore something. And we only put something in a wh underscore something module if it's absolutely White House specific. And this forces a really helpful architectural conversation during code reviews. So if someone adds a new module or a new theme to the code base and it's prefixed wh underscore, the code reviewer inevitably says, is this really White House specific? Does this really need to be White House specific? And in the overwhelming majority of situations, it turns out that whatever seemed White House specific is really something that should just be made configurable by administrators. And so, you know, that's, that's releasable. That's not a WH project. And in the, you know, once in a blue moon when we do have something that's White House specific, we separate the generic functionality from the White House specific stuff, and we put the White House config or the White House form alters or custom theming into a WH module. Lesson number five, uh, require readmes when adding new projects to the code base. For time, I'm going to not say any more about this. It saves a lot of headaches, right, readmes? Uh, Lesson number six. So lessons six through 10 are pretty geeky. Um, so I'm going to just give a quick sound bite on each of these. And if there are developers who want to dig deeper into any of these details, I'd be happy to do that during Q&A. So uh, lesson six, make installation profiles. Uh, they're testable, and they make local development so much easier, and that really improves velocity in development. Um, lesson number seven, manage patches with Drush Make. Otherwise, it's a very fast downward spiral into maintaining forked contributed projects. I think one more. You're one slide behind. Oh, shoot. Thank you. Lesson seven, drush make. Uh, otherwise, there's a downward spiral into maintaining forked projects. Thank you. Uh, lesson eight, subtrees are the answer to, um, for us, subtrees are, are the answer to uh, maintaining contrib projects outside of our site repository when we're doing work inside of site repositories. Um, Related lesson number nine, don't nest contrib projects inside other contrib projects. That's a really popular pattern for installation profiles. And whether, like us, you're using Git subtree or you're using submodules or a subtree merge strategy, um, this is, the, this is we have found is the secret to frictionless uh, project maintenance. And right, thank you. And we've got a boff coming up tomorrow about uh, build manager and Drush subtree if people are interested in that workflow. In lesson 10, automate builds. If it's just as easy to release, or if in the same step we're pushing to our drupal.org repos as at the same time as we're pushing to our production site, uh, you know, gets us eating our own dog food, and it just means we're releasing early and often internally and externally, and that's helpful. So um, with that, before, I, before we, we do Q&A here, I just want to ask if we have any uh, core contributors in the room, uh, if we just see your hands, or any members of past or present of the White House uh, dev team, um, or anyone who's contributed to a contrib project that you know you know that we use in the White House code base. Um, so I just want to say thank you to you guys. You know we're standing on the shoulders of giants uh, in all of the projects that we're working on. Uh, you know none of this obviously would be possible without the the great work that has gone into the things we're building on top of, and we really greatly appreciate it. So thank you. So with that. Um, here's how you can find us on Drupal.org, on GitHub, um, developer info on whitehouse.gov, and a list of our projects on Drupal.org. And if anyone is interested in reusing any of our stuff or working with us to make our stuff reusable for you, we would really like to help people you know, use this stuff. So uh, I'll be sprinting on that Friday if anyone is interested to join me. So with that, should we do questions? Just make sure you... Make sure you come to the mic for a question because we're being recorded. Hello. Um, I'm like a huge fan of the whitehouse.gov. We're redesigning our website. I was in the government sync up with you guys yesterday. But can you talk a little bit about the user experience on the site? Because it's a massive amount of information that's on the site, but somehow it's just elegant and seamless. And can you just talk a little bit about that process of how you got there? I mean, I mean, it. To be honest, it's a, it's a uh, it's it's been an evolution over time. It wasn't always that way. Um, we have some really uh, fantastic designers who are very forward-thinking people, and um, I would like to say there's a formal process by which we do sort of user 
you know, user experience evaluation and testing. Um, but we do a we do like a lot with like Google experiments and things like that. So we do we do test out functionality. But in terms of an overall, um, in terms of like an overall information architecture or content architecture, um, that's basically a work in progress, I would say. And we're sort of reevaluating even now as we look towards sort of rolling out more responsive parts of the site, more more excuse me, more responsive design onto the site. So not a great answer to your question, I, I grant, but I would like I would like to say that there's an easy way to sort of just take a, an overview. There's a good session yesterday on uh, um, uh, um, like d uh, domain architecture in terms of like shaping, you know, uh, auditing and analyzing and, and categorizing your sort of your content and how to come up with a strategy to to, to structure it. Uh, it was really fascinating. I don't remember who gave it, but you should look for that one. Uh, it, was, it was called uh, uh, Deliverables for Content Design. What's that? They were wearing giant blue foam hats. Okay. Can you, Sam Boyer and I want to say in the mic so everyone hears. Snugug. Okay. But yeah, definitely go check out their uh, their talk when it's online. But yeah, please go ahead. Hey guys, uh, thanks again for the presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, just looking at the uh, contrib modules, I didn't see anything mentioned about the long page functionality. Could you elaborate a little bit more about how you implemented that? Was that panels and custom panel panes, or what was your strategy for that? Good question. I skipped that. Uh, so long page is actually a, another great example of you know, we haven't open sourced that work because there are entanglements with some legacy WH modules. So um, yeah, you know, it, it solves a similar problem as panels. Um, we don't use panels anywhere else in this particular site. And panels is, you know, really a, an excellent, you know, Drupal site builder tool, not always a perfect fit for, you know, people who are just content administrators. So long page was our sort of simplified approach to that. So the goal is then to eventually get that as a contrib module then? after it's untangled from all the, the legacy stuff? We've definitely talked about it. We'd love to do it. Uh, it takes a lot of time to go back and, and refactor the legacy stuff, and um, uh, there are a lot of people who'd love to do it, myself included. We'll see okay. where it goes. Okay, thank you. Hi. I have a question about uh, security. So um, usually when you reveal um, anything about the way something is built, Right, you give a malicious uh, person all kinds of attack vectors. And so if you have someone who, let's say, who knows Drupal and can go through this code, what kind of s steps do you have to take so that you can share, okay, but also protect yourself from, you know, malicious attacks? Um, I'll yeah, so the, 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 there's a lot in that question. I grant it's something we talk about a lot, and I get a lot of questions about how we get to this place where we can open source so much stuff. Uh, the place I start with, and what I talk to you know uh, uh, security engineers a lot with, and this is a, a phrase I've actually only recently kind of come to for the first time. But if like um, you know, if if um, it, when your code base is essentially like the, when your security posture like depends on like knowing no one knowing what your code says, like, someone can essentially, like, undo that security by, like, you know, cut and paste an email. Um, if, like, someone on the inside could cut and paste your code. If you just, if you just, I we always work from a place that I assume that my code is, is, like, that someone has it. And that's a much, e that's a much, I think, safer posture to start from, from a security perspective. Um, from stuff to talk about, come to the legacy stuff that, that we did when we did want to first uh, get the petitions platform out into the, uh, into the uh, open source space. We definitely uh, had a very, um, we actually brought in uh, some outside vendors to do a pretty thorough uh, security audit of that code base. Um, and then the points that Brian, so when we bring in, same thing, when we bring in uh, any contrib module that we use, like we have an internal team who subjects that to a, a series of, of, of security uh, uh, won't go too much into the detail, but we, we do security audits of the contrib modules that we use for the stuff that we build. The, the, the tactics that Brian was talking about a lot about actually sort of getting to this place where, where commits are, you know, three files, 20 lines, things like that, you know, day in and day out, it becomes a much easier, we, we sort of have this baseline that we've established from that big security audit, you know, that, that 
you know, everything we're sort of building from, we have a sense that that is as secure as we think we can make it, and then um, we're building upwards from there. And that's the, Brian's point about like a, a massive drop in regressions, meaning that that if we're not sort of undoing stuff we've already done or blowing away stuff we've already done, we're just we're essentially standing on level footing and walking our way up the ladder. So we only have to to audit the new stuff. That is part of our QA procedures. But we were doing it in a way now where it's, we're doing it in much smaller chunks, and there's a actual sort of audit trail of like who's who's reviewed it, you know, uh, um, like checks in place to make sure that like Brian's not reviewing his own code, et cetera. You addressed this a bit with the long with the long page, and but the White House has a lot of different page looks, and and as you said, a lot of them are code and uh, code and node. What? Is there a tension between the designers and the developers try of trying to stay, of developers trying to move toward a more standardized form, whereas develop, I mean, designers trying to be have that creativity of not having to be constrained to a node? How often do you use, do you make a new template type? How, I mean, a new content type? Like, what what is the relationship there between all the different types of content on White House? Um, we, we, can, we can both agree. I really want to hand in these design questions. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think there, there there is a tension there. It's actually not. Um, it's not been my experience that it's been a great like tension of like the the d designers wanting to have a kind of flexibility to do like uh, more new things. It actually tends to be more of like a like a time driven. Like we need to do something really fast. And our engineers. I heard a great. Uh, there was a great talk yesterday that like like designers should code like the way that painters mix paint like with that level of frequency. And so we have really talented designers who can also code. And in a lot of cases, it's just, it's just plain faster for them to, you know, I'm just going to put this into a node and do it. And so that's, that's where more of that like code in the node type stuff comes from, yeah. But we're working. I mean, we're definitely focused on kind of getting away and giving them the tools, like Brian says, so that we don't need to do that anymore and still can deliver the, the design features that they're looking for. Hi, great to hear. Um, I'm just interested in, in uh, all your use of GitHub and the sharing of the, the code. Are you seeing other federal agencies pick up and use these things? Are there any, any kind of related success stories from federal agencies? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Brian wants to talk about this too, I know. So I'll just say it quickly. Actually, about it, two years ago now, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau like published an open source policy. They're putting their stuff on GitHub. There's other, I mean, you probably even read in. This person sitting behind you is also runs a Drupal for Gov organization. Yeah, I, I think if you check out the um, open data policy website, which I want to say is opendatapolicy.github.io, um, there's a link to a list of all the federal government agencies that have GitHub accounts. There are a number of them now. A growing number. We have government organizations as customers, and they're keen to use Drupal. Um, did you go through the certificate of net worthiness um, procedure, or did you, and is that something that we could? What was, I, I there was a word you said there that I couldn't Certificate of net worthiness? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, sorry, yeah, we call it a CNA, yeah, absolutely, we go through a um, accreditation, certification and accreditation, we did, absolutely, go, uh, we have a, we have internal teams who, that's what they do, and it's the same team, like I said, they do that, we actually do that for each module, for each contrib module that we, we use, absolutely. I think we've got folks arriving for the next session. So uh, I, I, we've got two more minutes on our clock. Minutes? If have folks more? have more questions, we've got two more minutes, and I plan on using them. So, well, all right then. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.